never know what will happen at Worlds. The stage is set, the curtain is drawn. This is the game people want to see. Kaboom! They flip the fuse! Welcome everyone to World's Countdown, where we're looking ahead at the day's games. This Group B playing as we get a look at the teams preparing for the day at hand. Yesterday was very, very exciting, and Inspired seems to be having a lot of fun as he is vibing in his chair. Rogue is going to hit the rift. Is, was that a Salt Bay impression? I don't know what's going on, <laughs> but you're getting a look at Rogue through the lens of the Oppo cam, capturing the best moments of Worlds 2020, or, you know, at least the preparation leading up to them. Hello, everyone. My name is Shox. I'm joined by Amazing and Frost Gurren, where we're looking back on yesterday and looking forward to today. And yesterday, Group A did give us a couple of surprises. It was a roller coaster. Amazing. Yeah, it started off pretty strong for G2. They looked really, really clean. And then suddenly, at the end of the day, had the, both the game against Tuning and then the tiebreak against them, lost both. So. We didn't quite expect that. I had no. high hopes. Oh, I mean, we had high hopes, uh, maybe for some of these teams. In the end of the day, though, I think Suning and G2 going through was rather along the lines of the pre-tournament expectations. But the way in which it happened was quite dramatic, Frosker. And Team Liquid ends up leaving the tournament, but they ended up picking up three games, two yesterday and one in the first round. They got so close, but it didn't matter. I mean, it was just a heartbreaker. Moment. Yeah. A, uh photo finish, if you will, yes. for Suning and G2 to pull over the line right there. Uh, unfortunately for TL, they kind of turned around their entire play style, but it was too little too late. That loss to Machi really punishing them in the first round. And, you know, what coulda, shoulda, woulda, but just wasn't <laughs> enough there. And uh, I feel for the North American brethren. But yeah. on the, uh, the positive side, NA, G2 lost twice to Suni, so it wasn't like we just did you dirty yeah. and then lost or then yeah. won the, the tiebreaker match. Yeah, unfortunately, if you missed that yesterday, it, it all came down to if G2 was able to beat Suning in that first game, they would have also given TL the tiebreaker versus Suning. But that's the World Championship. You can't be relying on other teams to make it happen for you. You have to make it happen yourself. And for G2, they didn't at the end of the day. They got that second seed. They really fell apart against Suning, Frosker. Uh, the early games looked so good, and then as soon as we hit big game, it was just kind of like a 180 turn. A little bit of, a little bit of inting sometimes. Yeah. And Suning definitely punishing. Like, no, 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 this is illegal. I'm going to have to pull you over, <laughs> sir. Check your credentials and slap them. No, I'm really glad that they showed at least the proficiency in the early game. But I do think that the late game execution, especially when it comes to flanks and everything like that and watching those, it was concerning to me because I do expect G2 to be a really, really strong team fighting team. And that's how they won a ton of games last year too. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's a weird turnaround to have a stronger early game and a weaker late game now. It is, and I think we can all agree on the fact that this isn't 2019 G2. They look a lot rougher around the edges, a lot weaker, some would say for sure. And amazing, you said it in rehearsal, they did do the same thing last year, exactly the same thing, in yeah. fact, with dropping to Griffin. We should not be too worried because they did do it last year. And honestly speaking, in the first week of groups, they also look kind of shaky so they always have to turn around coming in at some point point. Yeah, and i think it's also about you know setting context what you just kind of brought up there shocks is this idea of what are the expectations for G2? I hear the word kind of tournament favorites thrown around. I don't personally sit there. I, do I think, think we've lost that. That train has left the station. <laughs> yeah, I, know, right? I do it's think gone. that uh, G2 might still be on the cusp of a dark horse this tournament, yeah. as well as Suning. You know, they're, they have the LPL title attached to their name, but you can see that it gets a little bit rough and dirty there, especially in closing out on very strong leads in late game. So um, I think Suning and G2 looking like comparable first and second yeah. seeds, and whoever draws them a quarter is actually probably going to feel pretty good with the inconsistencies that they showed in groups. Definitely so. And then to take just a more moment uh, to talk about Suning, as said, the third seed coming out of the LPL plagued with inconsistency throughout the season, but finishing strong. And they do seem to be going from strength to strength, especially in that top lane. We'll get a look at that gangplank later. Don't you worry. Um, but this is hopeful, you know, a lot of rookies on that lineup stepping up when it matters the most. And I was talking about this the other day. I feel like in kind of the same lens that we look at Rogue, we should really look at Suning and that this is a very young 
inexperienced team. You can see some of that experience really biting them, especially in their late game macro decisions uh, and the inconsistencies there. And it is more about a massive learning opportunity. Yeah, we're super excited to see Sword Art and SOFM, Sword Art finally making it to groups, SOFM finally making his debut on the international stage. But uh, Ben, Angel, and Huang Fong are the little babies still. You know, they got a lot of growing to do, and this is a great first impression for them on Worlds. Yeah, definitely. Especially SFM has been really, really incredible to me. I kind of criticized him early on for his lead sim play because I didn't think it was that impressive. But after seeing his lead play, and like he just turned around for me, and I think now I'm actually on the on the side where. He, he has looked really, really good to me. He has, and I'm super excited seeing him go up against some of these other junglers in the tournament for SOFM. But the Red Bull top play, that came at the very last moment of the tiebreaker match yesterday. Bin's gangplank gave G2 no chance for a parlay. Oh, I can't watch it. Yeah, usually wouldn't expect the gangplank to flank. <laughs> and then he double barrels on top of his own ultimate. I think that play in itself is just incredible to me. And uh, yeah, I guess he got the win for the team. He G did. G2 yeah. just went into flat. They're like, no, not again. Not again. again. Not again. <laughs> and LP on top lane are blast us when we're all grouped up. It was the shy all over again. And we got to say, Bin overall, though, super impressive group stage. And just yeah. in the tradition of the other LPL top laners, they can play weak side, they can play strong side, they can turn around a game like that. It's the versatility. And I yeah. want to give a huge shout out to the LPL, the fact that we're bringing uh, 369, Bin, and Zoom. I was yes. like, there's Explain one today. more name. <laughs> <laughs> One more name that I had forgotten there. Um, it feels like the Shy kind of really changed the whole meta when Invictus Gaming won the World Championship. And then the LPL, like, we need to go back to the go-goings and the PDDs. We need to have hard carry yeah. top laners. And they showed up massive this split. Yeah, it's really, really important that they actually understand that because the facilitating nature of their ex uh, top laners that they we've seen in the past, especially on RNG, for yeah, example, <laughs> um, I think that in itself will not fly anymore because of the fact that you have to have that top lane flexibility coming in. You need to be able to play carriers, bruisers, and you need to be able to play tanks too. We're going to do a deep dive into the top lane in just a little bit. Another thing I wanted to talk about, which has been one of the main takeaways from yesterday's games and all of the group stage, is the increased importance of level ones. And I wanted to have a bit of a deeper conversation about it. First off, Amazing, do you think this is something that we'll see continued in Group A mostly like we did yesterday, or is it going to be every game from now on? It should be every game, given the fact that there's the, the same objectives apply to every game, right? Early game control is really important, and having a good jungle start is also really important. So. As long as you see a champion like Lilia, as long as you see champions like Grace and Lily in the jungle, you need to set yourself up for success. And I think a level one invade, especially when you have stronger champions, is just doing that and it's playing on your strengths. And I think what Amazing is saying here is really important in understanding that it's very dependent on the champions that are in the ecosystem right now, not just the bot lanes, but the junglers in particular. You know, why are level one so strong? Well, the Lilias and the Graves and the Nidalees can really abuse when you have a split map. And if you have priority around that, they can basically take over a game and end it on a level one. We've heard from both the LCS yeah. and LEC representatives talking about the importance of level ones. And for me, they almost feel like uh, lane swaps a little yeah. bit. Oh, is that like what you would compare it to? Kind of the strategic trend that is now popping up at the beginning of a game? Yeah, the execution especially is really, really difficult because you have to understand there are so many moving parts, right? Are you going to move a top lane down to bottom lane to defend and invade? Is that going to, how is it going to affect the top side of the map? And then splitting the map is like another thing that you can do to basically set yourself up for success where if you shut off the enemy bot lane, suddenly they can't play the game anymore. They can't push up anymore. And if they do push up, they get frozen upon. So there's so many tactical advantages you can get through a map split that it actually becomes like more or less like a lane swap scenario. Mm -hmm. And again, I really just want to underline this. It's also the proficiency of the caliber of teams that we have on the world stage, that if you give them this kind of opportunity where suddenly a lane cannot play at all because they're on weak side, because they don't have jungle support, they literally just run away with the game. There's just nothing you can do at this high of a level. And I think uh, let's do our due diligence. And if we see it happen, Happening today, let's go a bit deeper because I think up to, until now we've just said, oh, there's another yeah. another <laughs> invade or there's another level one. But let's look at why this is possible, yeah. what items there are, what you know, uh, champions on the map, what dynamics we have to take into a core. Because I'm sure we'll see a lot of interesting uh, level ones. I hope so, at least. We'll be stepping away for just a second, but when we return, we're going to look ahead towards today's action as the teams in Group B fight for a spot in the quarterfinals.
gonna do now? It's your reflection looking back to pull you up. So you're gonna die. Playing with matches, come out of the ashes underneath you. A million voices in the crowd, they're screaming. We'll let them swallow the pride, just turning the tides.够在小组赛出现，绝对是一个光荣。我觉得，如果我们能够把我们的实力发挥出来的话，绝对是这组的黑马。Storm though, a lot of stunts coming out. Kaiwin's going low. Hanabi's tanking, and River gets the kill. I made it to quarterfinals last time I went to Worlds. It was also in China. I will never forget that time. 所以，我觉得今年是非常类似，因为是被压制的，然后被超越期待。哇，那这个会被压缩掉，立刻，但他们会找到那个人，因为他们早就被压缩掉了。JDG 和 Damon， 他们是绝对被压缩掉的。我将告诉所有人，说这将是一场惨烈的游戏。一七年的时候，就主场的决赛，没有我们 LPL 队伍，但是我希望今年一定会有，所以压力还是会有的。想为 LPL 拿下三连冠。一等 team 으로와서팬분들이좀기대감은더커진것같은데어부담감은딱히뭐그때랑비교해서달라진건없는것같아서제일걱정되는팀은그냥진동인것같고어진동은팀적으로뭔가를설계하는플레이가장점인것같고단점은이제팀적으로설계하는플레이가잘안풀렸을때좀급격히무너지는것같아요 It's going to be a very exciting rematch between Dom One and JDG. I don't think JDG got enough out in their first match. We will give you guys a glimpse of the second place in LPL. Thank you very much. A very nice teaser there, encapsulating everything we may expect today. Now, in terms of possible drama, yesterday was pretty crazy, but Group A was also very close going into it, both in terms of scoreline and in terms of how the games played out. For Group B, it's a bit of a different story. 
any team that is higher placed than the team they've played has demolished them. It isn't even close statistically, as well as kind of the impression we get. Dom1 seems to be head and shoulders above everyone else. JDG under it, Rogue under it, PSG under that. So I hope we get especially a step up from the side of JDG today, Froskuren, who went into the tournament as possible tournament favorites, then got knocked down a peg. Yeah, it's... Uh it's exciting in the sense that I think that the League of Legends or the caliber of League of Legends that we can see in Group B should be really high. Yeah. And if it is yeah. going to be a smash, it will be an absolute dismantling that is just like chef's kiss to watch. And so <laughs> even if it feels bad, like Rogue, definitely the underdogs here, I just I hope that we see really clean League and we really get a good look at two of the possible tournament favorites as well as maybe a very strong Dark Horse. I know we just heard from the teaser PSG saying that they could be a Dark Horse for the group, but I also think Rogue should be considered as yeah. well. Yeah, let's see. Anything can happen. No, for, for me, it's definitely Rogue being the Dark Horse. I think they have shown some uh, upsides in the, in the first week already. I think their game against Demon wasn't that bad. I think they actually showed that they can hang with the big boys as well as the group. And I think for week two, like, hopefully we'll see some more improvement. If it was easy, it wouldn't be a world championship, right? <laughs> so we'll keep that in mind. Let's dive into a couple of matchups that are going to be very important and maybe start with the top lane as a whole, which has been very influential, especially yeah. yesterday. And we have two different styles. Now, before we dive into it, <laughs> at the world championship, we're always throwing around yeah. terms and cast and whatnot, but not always explaining them. Talk to me about what is the difference between a carry-inspired top laner and a weak side top laner? Yeah, so as we throw these terms around, like carry Carry side just or carry top lane just means that this guy can be the focal point of a comp. So he's not required to carry, but he's more often than not going to be put in that position. For example, we see that with Nuggery, where he's going to be put on the Camille as a blind pick even and then played around. A weak side top lane is more or less someone that can sometimes be the focal point of a comp, but honestly speaking, will not often be. And he's more or less a facilitator, someone you play off of, rather than someone you play around. And this is also a conversation of Weak side top laner kind of gets a bad reputation yeah. and a, a, a dirty reputation, <laughs> if you will. But sometimes you do it because that's what your team needs. So in the case of like a Damwon versus a Rogue, you know, Damwon usually play through the top side of their map. They play through Nuke yeah. and Showmaker and Canyon kind of bounces between them. And you wouldn't ever call Ghost and Barrel a weak side bot lane. <laughs> um, but it's about setup versus being set up for. Yeah. So, the likes of Rogue use Finn, it's usually for setup and facilitating the other players around him as they play through Han Sama and Vander. And for Damwon, it's again, it's that top side trident, if you will, of carrying through the yeah. top lane, the jungle, and the mid lane. Let's go down the line then, amazing. Uh, Nagari, for instance, I think the scary thing is that everything you just explained, he kind of showed it all. He had the Lulu, yeah. he had the Ken and team fighting, and he had the Camille solo carry, the total package. Yeah, that's the incredible part to me about him, where he's able to play every single style. He's not required to do anything, like any single style, but he's he can basically do everything. So I think that itself is such a strategic advantage to the draft and everything like that, because he can play the Lulu and suddenly facilitate for his graves. And he can also play the Camille and suddenly play Topward. So I think these two things are really, really important to the flexibility of the draft and obviously to the flexibility of the top lane itself. Mm -hmm. And I think I really want to compliment Nagari's ability to team fight. I think Ender called him the best team fighting top laner in that cast when he pulled out the Kennen uh, Smeb-esque yeah. flank against PSG. And it's the fact of the matter that he does that multiple times. His patience, his setup, how he's uh, facilitating his carries, even when he is on things like the Lulu versus like the Kennen, is just, uh, it's amazing to watch. He is such yeah. a focal point of what makes Dan one so terrifying and why so many people have them as tournament favorites to take it all. Yeah, and honestly, his Lulu play is not really facilitating, I guess, <laughs> when I saw it, because he was just at the enemy him. tower, 20 CS up and winning the lane that hard. So uh, he makes weak lane champions carry champions. Yeah, and he is, I think, really, you know, an anomaly also. Yeah. You know, he's up there with the best of the best. Then we get to Zoom from JDG, also, again, an LPL top laner. We know he's got some skills, but what do you think of him as a whole so far, Frost? Oh, Zoom has been so impressive, and I've been waiting for this uh, side of the Dumpling Duo to make his debut on the international stage. Uh, a lot of the times, Go Going gets thrown around when talking about Zoom. He can do it all, similar to Nagari. He can play the carries, he can play the bruisers, he can play the tanks, and he does so, so well. Um, you heard it in the teasers, uh, Dan, one more talking about the strengths of JDG, the fact that them as a team is so powerful, okay. and Zoom's presence in team fights, his target selection, his zone control, he has a dirty gangplank, is a huge factor uh, for JDG. Yeah, what I like about him especially is just the fact that he's able to team fight that particularly well. And he's actually always identifying what he has to do locks down the right targets, and he has this aggressive, almost like bruiser page style within himself, independently of which champion he plays. So I think that in itself is like such a stylistic advantage for them. 
I also think like JDG uh, in comparison to some of the others, they actually don't spend too much time around him and he also spends a lot of time in his lane. He's just doing it by himself and then joining for the team fights and um, he's doing every style really, really well. Looking at some of the other top laners in the group, we have Rogue and Finn. Now we called it out as possibly something yeah. that could be exploited, but we've seen that they've worked around it. And I think Finn gets, he gets a bit of a bad rep, doesn't he, Frost? Uh, and again, it's, if you think back to Finn's champion pool, he used to be known as like the Aatrox, Kled, Aurelia, uh, one trick. So he was famous for kind of these bruisers. And the fact of the matter is, is he has chosen to take a step back and play a facilitating style for his bot lane because so many resources go to Larson inspired Han Sama and Vander. Yeah, for them, it's just about the identification now, which champions they want to roll with. Because for them, obviously the GP didn't quite work out. It was too far behind. I think it was too slowly scaling for what Rogue actually wants to do on the map. So the likes of Maokai, Ma Ma Malphite, whatever it is, like tanks top lane that have some agency in the early game will probably bode well for them in the future. And we shouldn't immediately say, oh yeah, go put him on a tank. It could actually be used as a strength for both Rogue and for PSG. It's up to the coaching staff to kind of draft a composition that can work against the powerhouses on the other team. Yeah, it is really, really important that you understand, hey, when we run against a tank top lane, then we actually have to do certain things that may not be required in normal draft. So we can't blind pick the grades, for example, because then they're going to run the Kindred, then you have a tank Kindred combo, suddenly you're going to be behind in the draft and you're not going to be able to win late game. So there's some kind of like things uh, that you always have to account for when you run against certain types of uh, compositions. Yeah, it's just the creativity of how they're problem solving, you know, either doing around uh, shallow champion pools or expanding different champion pools in different positions. And just because you see a tank in the top lane doesn't necessarily mean that that top laner can't hang. <laughs> yeah. It's got so many other <laughs> factors to it. Yeah, it does. I hear you mentioning a lot of combinations. If you have yep. this top, then you need this jungle. So let's talk a bit about the jungle because it's also stacked in this group specifically. Let's start with Canyon, who um, it's hard to shine on a lineup as a jungler, you know, this stack normally <laughs> but especially when you have nagari showmaker but he's still able to pull it off yeah and the synergy with the lanes especially nagari and showmaker is just incredible to me so uh what he does is he identifies what he has to do and he has the mechanics to back it up which is not something you can obviously say about every jungler in the True. Yeah, words it's quite difficult to make nidalee work it's quite difficult to make grace work and he makes it without any issues whatsoever. Yeah, it's the mechanical proficiency and the fact that, like you said, he's flanked between Nuggery and Showmaker, so it is slightly easier that you have two very powerful solo laners, but it still then means that this guy is set up for success. And Look at the power pose, too. <laughs> <laughs> once the dominoes are set up, you still got to knock them down, and Canyon does so very beautifully. It is a very precise game plan yeah. from Dam One, and he's kind of the uh, the primary chess piece that's moving around what his solo laner set up for him. So you're saying it looks easy to us when you look at the Dom One games, but he has a big role in making sure it all plays out that way. Listen. I see Canyon play in Italy, and I'm like, ah, oh, I can do that. And then I go and try to play in Italy, I'm like, oh no, I can't do this. <laughs> and a lot of junglers on the world stage still can't yep. do it as well as this guy does. All right. <laughs> yeah, and being a jungler for such a precise team is actually pretty hard because you have to be on time for everything that happens on the map. So for example, wave pushes in, suddenly you have to be there. Then you have to be on the opposite of the map to, for example, cover a dive. So there's so many things that you have to do. You have to be mechanically precise, but you also have to be right on time every single time. So it's hard to jungle when everyone's feeding, but it's also <laughs> hard it's, when everyone's doing when everyone's really, really as, well. Yeah, it's pretty hard. What you're saying is jungle is the hardest role in the game. Amazing. Of no course, surprises of there. Are you biased? Of or course. What's going on? The jungle? <laughs> uh, talk to me about Kanavi. He was super hyped coming into this world championship and maybe Damwon and Canyon ran away with a lot of kind of the praise out of week one. But Frosk, what can we expect of this guy? Justice for Kanavi. He <laughs> still <laughs> deserves a very strong honorable mention. It feels like the LPL holistically, in my opinion, brought the strongest junglers when you look across all of their seeds. SOFM, uh, Karsa and Kanavi are all just amazing standouts. And Kanavi wow. got a bad run against uh, Dan one in the first game. I want to see how he fares in the second one. Very yeah. similar type of play style. I believe he's uh, touted as the best jungler in the LPL right now and was a huge factor of why JDG rose to prominence. It was a shame that we didn't have MSI because JDG were the MSI champions. They should have already shown the world how strong they are. It's a shame we didn't have MSI for many, many, many reasons. Um, finally, let's touch on Inspired uh, because here in yeah. the LEC, we hyped him up quite often and he really grew into a role and showed that he can do different things. But, you know, when you're up against the likes of a Dom One and a JDG Amazing, how hard is it then to be a jungler? It is really, really hard because you have to account for more things than not. So when you're we playing against weaker teams, you can kind of like identify your own place and run with it no matter what. But when you run against jungles that are the likes of Canyon, that are the likes of Kanavi, you have to account for their place, that you have to account what they're doing. So that in itself makes you honestly uh, adjust strategically 
And honestly, you have to also play towards their mechanical strengths too. So you have to be able to execute perfectly and you have to account for what they're doing on the map. So he has actually adjusted to a certain extent. I don't think he's quite there yet, mm. but he's humble. He's someone that has always tried to learn from, I guess, the elderly even, you know, like someone like me to a certain extent even. So he has always been like someone that has to uh, absorb like a lot of knowledge. And I think now with week two coming in, with another week of practice, maybe he's going to come in. Uh, Let's hard. see. We'll hope so, at least. Uh, for the schedule, at least a tight race in Group B. Maybe not so much for Dam One. They kick off, though, versus PSG Talent, and hopefully we can get an upset on the board. And at the end of the day, we will know who goes to the quarterfinals. And as always, any tiebreakers will be played at the end of the day. JDG versus Dam One. The rematch, which a lot of people are looking forward to, is totally at the end. So moving on now with Group B. Group B on the board. We talked already about the junglers. We talked already about the top laners, but um, amazing. I think you're going to break down something for us specifically, so take it away. I shall do that. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, no. That's on me. That's not on me. <laughs> it is what it is. Is that the microphone? Yeah, but we can still hear you. Go ahead. Okay, Go then ahead. I shall start. <laughs> we don't want to have technical difficulties be the problem. All right, as we see in this clip right now, um, we basically have a situation in which Damwon and JDG are facing up at the Herald, and they're trying to basically identify what they have to do at this certain time. So as we play the clip, and we see it right now, thank you very much, um, we see Damwon right now taking the Herald, and as they're, as they're doing that, JDG is now chasing into the show code. And what I like about this play in itself is that Damwon actually identifies what they have to do and how they have to postpone almost that fight in order to get more on the map. So they hold the curtain call, they make it slow, and now we see the they they, the strategic mind that is behind them in order to identify what they have to do on the map. So they go to mid lane, have the hell pop, get the turret down, then they walk in into the enemy jungle. We see it here right now where Cannon actually gets deep vision, identifies what the enemy may do, and suddenly they also get the dragon. And if that's not everything, they actually then also walk back to mid lane, take the next mid wave, and then fight what JDG again has to do in order to get an advantage and deny it again. So they get a full reset, nothing wrong happening. So they actually get everything they want and, and deny everything that the enemy could, could want themselves. And as we see here right now, hopefully that's gonna work. Sorry for the Telestrator issues, my bad. Um, so as we see here right now, Damwon is trying to identify what they have to do on the map from get, getting something out of nothing. And in this case, you know, they're actually only up 500 gold and they still try to make something happen. On the top side of the map, they see that the Ken Lulu matchup is now turning volatile. They can actually make a play around it. And now as we play, quick, quick hit on the, on the Lulu, get her, get her down. And what happens afterwards is basically what Nuggery is known for so far. That is basically mechanical execution and understanding how far he can push its champions. So he even dives a little between the turrets, then, as we see here, kills her and then takes the turret afterwards, which then transitions into 2.3 gold, 2.3k gold deficit for uh, PSG. And that gold swing in itself is just incredible to me, out of something that was as simple as a gank on the top side of the map. Thank you. Come on over here. Uh, thank you for that breakdown. And for us, <laughs> I just, I really want this game to be more competitive than the Telestrator versus Amazing fight. And, <laughs> and <laughs> the <laughs> technical <laughs> issues. Amazing fight. You did well. It's not easy. What I wanted to say coming out of that is that this is the feeling I always get when I'm watching really, really yeah. great players. You think. They're going in, surely they can take this trade, but they know exactly how far they can go. And I think as the enemy team, you keep walking away with a feeling of like, well, I could have won that trade, I'm going back in next time. And that's how they get you, because they're gonna beat you every single time. That's also what's gonna be the case here. We're looking at game one, a huge underdog game for PSG Talon. They are at 0-3, they must start the Miracle Run right now. With Miracle Runs, it is as such, you have to win every single game, and then still it isn't in your hands. So, up versus down one, a tall order, Frost Curran. What are we looking at for PSG? Uh, well, I will say that PSG actually had a good run the first time that they faced Dan One. Their early game was strong. It was the Kindred game, and they got a couple of kills with Kai Wing on Nautilus yeah. a couple of times, like hit back and forth. But ultimately, it came it down swung, to... swung back pretty quickly, yeah. <laughs> it came down to individual mistakes, I would say. So where PSG were finding openings as a team, really contesting, unlocking Kai Wing, using him to move around the map, having him on Nautilus for great setup. Uh, when it came to the individual 1v1s between uh, Hanabi and Nuguri, uh, the mid lane, Unified getting caught out, that's when Dan One just like dropped the hammer. They were like, we are done with this. You can try to skill check us <laughs> yeah. 1v1, and they did not have a good time. What's... 
just impressive about it is how quickly it happened too. It was like a quick gold swing. There was nothing happening on the map and suddenly, even though Barry at that point was even running into the enemy jungle, dying, and suddenly you have like a complete swing on the top side of the map. And that itself that they can identify wind condition momentarily and break it that wide open that quickly is the mark of a great team. It is for Dom1. We talked about the jungle in the top already. I want to approach it now from kind of a team-wide perspective, where if you look at the statistics, it is no surprise Dom1 is absolutely crushing every single category. It isn't even close because of the way they play. And I think we can't overstate just how dominant they've been so far, Froskern, but I want to focus it in on comparing it to what we saw out of them last year, because as you remember, also stomped the group stage, didn't drop yep. a single game, but this is still a very different Dom one. It, it feels like, as you've put it, they've buttoned up. That yes. the, they've ascended now to kind of the final form. We've heard so many whispers about how terrifying this team is in scrims, how deep that they should have gone, and it was kind of a, an odd head scratcher to see them collapse, but not necessarily out of the wheelhouse, because again, they're inexperienced yep. they had previously. Now running it back, they look so much tighter, so much more disciplined. And now it's like, okay, this is the damn one that we've been promised realized on the world stage. Yeah, we kind of saw Cinema change actually for Fnatic in 2017 to 2018. They had a rough, I mean, they had a graph group phase at that point, but then in 2018, they came back and actually went to the World Finals because they get together as a team to identify what the issues were. And they basically then became closer and knew what they had to do at all times. And I think that kind of like experience advantage at some point that comes in after a year is really important for a world's team. And experience is always important. And I know we always say, you know, you have to win when you're on the world stage, but those things do matter. And it's up to each team by itself to recognize what they have to work on and elevate that coming into the next year. A long way they've come from 2019, Frosker. And can you pinpoint it down and, and tell me kind of what you've seen so far in different styles and different things where they've cleaned it up so far that makes you think that deep run is definitely on the card? I think it's the versatility that they can play and the quick look that we've gotten from their three games. They've shown that they, can play through the yeah. jungle, that they can play through the top side, that they can play a, a wide variety of different matchups. The fact that they have such talented individual players, especially in their solo laners. So it's like, it's almost to be able to ride this ride, you must meet this uh, skill check requirement. And that's very dangerous yeah. against Nuguri and Showmaker, especially if you give them advantageous matchups. They absolutely punish you for that. So it's the fact that you have to be uh, willing to fight them in the lane phase. You cannot give a free early game to them. And then you have to be, be willing to out-execute them in the late game in some of the cleanest team fighting that I've ever seen. So as a whole complete <laughs> package. Are you giving them any chance? <laughs> they have great wave <laughs> this, clear. They this have good hurts. CS and good dinner. We can just pack it up right now with the World Championship, apparently. I think it's about Ghost and Barrel. I think yeah. um, this is where teams have been trying to get their advantage, having a strong 2v2 bot side and then unlocking the support. And while we know that Nugri and Showmaker are hard to punish, maybe you can try to find advantages there and just create a much stronger 2v2 and get your support rolling in so that Showmaker isn't 1v1, he's 3v1. Maybe. <laughs> Final thoughts, amazing. Uh, uh, I don't think I have anything to add. I think everything was said that has, has ever to be said. So uh, I, I'm, I'm with you on that We've one. We've set it up for you, PSG. We've praised Damwon into the heavens. This is your time for an upset. Time for us to send it off to Captain Flowers and Kobe for game one. Good luck.